Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I'm your host, your guide, your teacher, <laughs> Nicholas Tyson. Um, so today we're going to be moving on to the Muromachi period. Um, we had a lot of fun with the Kamakura Jidai and everything going to hell <laughs> and everybody complaining about it. Uh, but now we're going to be moving on to a period of constant warfare. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the sort of the Kamakura period and the Muromachi periods are generally considered to be sort of like medieval Japan, uh, but it's really in the, the Muromachi period that you start to get the sort of um, the social relationships and also sort of the political arrangements that would eventually be solidified in the, um, the so-called warring states or Sengoku Jidai. Um, and then into the, the long Edo period, the long period of stability in the Edo period, which we will not be covering because this course only goes up to the year 1600. So this is our, our last unit for the class um, for this series of videos. And so I just wanted to sort of like demarcate that as we talk about um, two things today. So your first video for this week or for this unit <laughs> is going to be um, talking about the Genko War and um, our, our new protagonist slash villain slash something, um, Ashikaga Takauji, um, and the attempt on the part of the Emperor Godaigo to um, reassert imperial authority and try to like get himself back into um, power. As you all probably are aware, at least if you're even remotely familiar with Japanese history, it didn't really work out. So, but let's uh, let's share my screen so we can look at the R outline for today. So, um, first, I want to talk just sort of in general about sort of like medieval warrior culture, and the reason for this is because there are a lot of stereotypes about samurai and all that crap that um, are perpetuated both by people of the pale face, such as myself, but also interestingly enough by um, the Japanese themselves. And a lot of it's just straight up wrong. Um, so it's worth taking a close look at, you know, what actually happened in medieval Japan and like what medieval Japanese warfare was actually like, um, what the culture surrounding it was like. So that way you can be that person at parties who's like, well, actually the samurai, were, you know, Try not to be that person, but also to try to educate yourself. So, but the first thing I need to bring up in terms of like talking about the transition from um, the Kamakura period to the Muromachi period is this thing right here, the Genko War. What is the Genko War? Um, it was sort of a brief civil uprising from 1331 to 1333. In many ways, the uprising itself was not really that important. It's more sort of what it led to and so as the precipitating event for sort of certain like cultural changes that followed um it, it becomes important for that reason not necessarily for like what happened in and of itself so what was the Genko war so as i mentioned there was this dude the emperor godaigo who attempted to reassert imperial authority by rebelling against the kamakura shogunate so a couple of things to know about the, the Kamakura Shogunate, basically in the early 14th century through the mid 14th century, through the 1430s, is that the, the Minamoto were no longer really in charge. Um, in fact, the, the Minamoto were really only briefly the head of the Kamakura Shogunate. And it was for most of its existence led by the, the Hojo clan. Um, the Hojo are interesting for both historical reasons and also for pop culture reasons. For those of you who are familiar with the um, the Legend of Zelda, the symbol that's used for the Triforce is actually the Hojo um, crest. So, you know, they were into Zelda all the way back then. And the, the way that the Hojo sort of maintained control over the, the military dictatorship was largely through their control of the regency. And so this is a thing that we've, you know, recognized again and again in Japanese history. And we saw this with the Fujiwara, we saw it with the Taira, with the Minamoto, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is that those who have this sort of like adjacency or like indirect connection to the imperial line and sort of control that I guess you could say adjacency by like insert often inserting their own daughters into the line of imperial succession often exerted a lot of political control. And so that's what the, the whole Joe had accomplished at this point. 
Now, what's interesting, so when I talked previously about the, the Genpei War, um, I noted how in many ways this was the, the wars of the, the late Heian period and sort of that, that sort of spilled over into the early um, Kamakura period were really conflicts between rival families. So you had the sort of the, the dissolution of the Fujiwara, which then led to a rivalry between the Taira and the Minamoto. Initially, the Taira were successful, but then in the Genpei War, the Minamoto eventually overcome the Taira and become sort of the more ascendant um, clan for a brief period. Um, the Hojo, who were allied to the Minamoto, kind of took over in the power vacuum that was created by the sort of dissolution, of, not the dissolution, but sort of the a lot of internal struggles within the Minamoto clan. So again, all of that was based upon sort of like families that were in some sense related to or connected to the imperial family fighting amongst each other. Whereas in this case, we have a major clan actually fighting against the the emperor, or rather, actually the other way around, the emperor fighting against a major clan and, and trying to reassert its its own authority. Um, the way that which uh, Godaigo was attempting to do this is that he recognized that, particularly amongst the 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 samurai, the the warrior clans that um, supported the Hojo and were their retainers, um, that there was a lot of discon discontent among them. Um, they weren't super happy with a lot of the political and or like economic relationships that the Hojo established. Also, you know, you can imagine how originally these were all say like, you know, vassals of the, the Minamoto. And then suddenly like one of them like takes charge is like, oh no, now we're in charge. And we're like, well, no, we weren't retainers to you. We were retainers to the Minamoto. And so Godaigo attempted to use this, um, sort of bad blood to his advantage. And it initially kind of succeeded, but it fell apart due to our, our best bud today, Ashikaga Takauji. Ooh, I have I believe I have so I have a picture of Takauji. Actually let's the here's a picture of um Emperor Godaigo in sort of pseudo Chinese style dress. This is a very weird outfit for a Japanese emperor. So here's our dude Takauji. A couple of things to note about Takauji because it's indicative of sort of like warriors of this period. First, notice he's on horseback. Um, second, notice the sort of like long saber-like sword that he's using here. It has an even more sort of, um, I guess it's even more bent. <laughs> it has a, like a, 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 a steeper curve than your typical katana, than typical Japanese sword. Um, he's got arrows coming out of his back because Japanese warriors of this period were primarily horse archers, which is also why their armor is designed like this. It's sort of brocade armor that's extremely flexible, but also very weirdly shaped. It has these like, pan it has, like it's a bit of like flaps and panels rather than sort of like distinct like individual pieces. Um, later Japanese armor would be made very differently than this. But again, this is sort of well suited for fighting on horseback. So Takuji's got his long sword, and he's he's even holding. And it's interesting that to note in this painting, he's even holding it in the same way that, say, like a 19th century cavalry, like European cavalry officer, would, would hold their saber like up against their shoulder, because these are guys who fought from horseback, and so like the forms of like archery that they knew, the forms of swordplay that they knew, were all centered around fighting from horseback, and in fact one euphemism for warriors in this period is men of horse and bow, men of the horse and bow, because that was considered to be sort of central to who they were as, you know, fighting men. Now, the interesting thing about Takauji is that he was initially, <laughs> so he was, he was originally a vassal of the Hojo, or technically a vassal of the Minamoto. In fact, the um, the Ashikaga clan is um, distantly related to the Minamoto, in fact. So they were originally Minamoto vassals. So as you can see, like these were one of the, this, as will become clear, Takuji was one of the disaffected. And so initially he was a supporter of the Hojo and fought on their side, but was, and as you'll see in the 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 other reading for, for, this, for this particular week, the, the Taiheiki, um, he was sort of recruited, or rather he kind of recruited himself to the, the emperor's cause. Something that is not covered in the, well, it's covered in the Taiheiki, but it's not covered in the particular reading I'm going to give you guys. Um, he actually ends up betraying the emperor Godaigo um, and expels him from the, from the capital. 
And that leads to what in Japanese is referred to as, as Nambokcho, which um, sometimes is usually referred to in English as the, the Northern and Southern Courts period. So Takauji stayed in Kyoto, and that was his base of powers. So that was the Northern Court. And um, Godaigo fled to Yoshino, which is near Nara, and that's further south. So that's the Southern Court. And eventually the, you know, the, the Ashikaga completely overwhelmed the sort of the remnants of imperial loyalists to form the Ashikaga shogunate. Um, and that sort of is what, and it's um, Ashikaga's, I guess you could say betrayal of the emperor and his, and the expulsion of the emperor from Kyoto that begins what is now known as the Muramachi period. Um, so that being said, I'm sorry, I forgot, I mentioned, I forgot to note this. <laughs> in fact, that's why I, it's interesting how the, or, like how the, the order in which I have things listed here on my outline actually even reflects the order in which I typically remember things. So Takauji's rule begins the Muramachi period. However, the, the name for the period is, is, comes from the particular like court that was set up by his grandson, um, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu in Kyoto. So well, well after um, Takauji's death. So that's where the name of the period comes from. Although generally speaking, people consider the period to begin with Takauji himself as the first of the, the Ashikaga shoguns. So, <coughs> excuse me. So with all that in mind, so this is what this is what sort of gets this period um, rolling again. So it's similar. What we have is something similar to the end of the Heian period. Sort of things are sort of politically starting to come undone. There are like people, you know, vying for power in an attempt to sort of like reestablish the social order. Eventually, the social order is reestablished under the Ashikaga shogunate. Um, but with that in mind, so once again, we have another military dictatorship. We have another bakufu, another shogunate. But what's interesting about sort of this period in Japanese history is that sort of like the warrior culture of this time was very different. And so y'all may be familiar with this term right here, bushido, literally the way, the dole of a warrior, bushi. Um, but what's interesting about this concept, bushido, is that in many ways it's kind of a modern fabrication. Like the word ex has existed for a very long time. But the idea of the so of the so-called way of the warrior and its centrality to Japanese culture sort of writ large, that is actually a modern invention. Um, one of its most vocal proponents, this guy, Nitobe Inazo, who wrote a book literally called Bushido, the Soul of Japan, by the way, in English. Now, this is now that this is a very interesting point here, and I and I want you guys to follow this. So one of the primary proponents of sort of like this idea of like warrior culture as central to Japanese culture wasn't even really writing for a Japanese audience. He was writing for an English speaking and therefore international audience. And in fact, one of the, the biggest fans of this book was none other than Teddy Roosevelt, who's former president of the United States. And, general racist imperialist jerk and <laughs> so yeah i have it listed here is in my mind one of the greatest japan splainers because this was sort of a thing in the like late 19th and early 20th century this is sort of like the first wave of japan splaining when the country had recently sort of quote unquote reopened itself to the world there was this cottage industry of writers mostly academics at first although later also just lay writers as well who would try to sort of like explain japanese culture to the rest of the world and so um nitobe kind of made a name for himself by sort of like explaining warrior culture to those outside of japan and what's interesting is that like to japanese audiences later in life he would actually admit that he really didn't know all that much about like japanese military history or any of the things that he was like proposing to like expound upon so it's kind of strange um the other thing you really need to know about sort of this myth of warrior culture this idea of bushido is that it was very closely linked to japan modern japan's sort of like you know post 1868 so post like meiji and onward imperial ambitions in the 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries. So this whole idea of like the warrior spirit was something that was used to buttress the fact that Japan was, you know, colonizing other parts of East Asia. 
Um, the other sort of another important thing to bear in mind about so the thing is like what Nitobe is talking about doesn't come from nowhere. So like there actually were writers like you know early modern slash pre modern it depends on how you define the Edo period. Anyway, there were like 17th century writers and onward who did actually talk about warrior culture and like what a proper like theories of what a warrior should be. Um, people like um, Tsune Tomo is probably one of the most famous writers. He wrote a book called the Hagakure, uh, which talks extensively about, you know, like how to like cultivate yourself as a proper warrior, both in martial terms and in civil terms as well. But what's odd about these like warrior theorists, so to speak, is that their writing primarily comes from the Edo period, which is actually a period of relative peace. Unlike the, the Kamakura periods and the Muramachi periods, which were basically periods of constant like civil strife and upheaval and outright warfare, one of the things that we'll see in the Muramachi period is the war just kind of keeps happening. You had the the Genko War in the in the 1330s, and then shortly, so then the end of the 14th century and the beginning of the, the 15th century, you'll have the massive civil war known as the Onin War. And then you'll have various like inter like client like you'll have various like you know outbreaks of fighting between various warlords and their clans, which will ultimately end up in the sort of 150 year long period known as the the Sengoku Jidai, the Warring State period, the Warring States period that will then eventually lead to the sort of the relative peace of the Edo period. So the Muromachi period was like a period of constant warfare, and if there was ever going to be a time when, like you know the culture of the warrior was at its was at its height it really would be this period and yet strangely enough you don't see a lot of the sort of the theoretical writing coming from this period or even talking about it and so a lot of the theoretical writing about what warriors are and what they're supposed to be actually comes from a period of relative peace at a time when oddly enough even though you would have had a, like you know a, a class of society who would have been trained how to fight, how to use a sword, how to shoot a bow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They weren't really all that familiar with warfare at all. Like there weren't really a whole lot of wars in the 17th century or the 18th century in Japan. And so even though that's when they were writing and they were familiar with all of like the weapons and weapon technology and who they were as like warriors as a class, they weren't actually really all that familiar with what like actual warfare was like. So as a result, then, like what you see in the historical and literary accounts of medieval Japan actually paints a very different picture. And I want to talk briefly about this now. So the, some of the I'm going to talk very in very, very broad terms about Japanese feudalism, since this is not, you know, a class about sort of the history of medieval Japan. Um, I'm just going to sort of lay down sort of the broad strokes. And especially as it relates to the sort of notion of warrior culture. Um, what's interesting is how, like, from basically the Edo period on, writers primarily understood the relationship between a lord and his vassals, or her vassals, in some case women could be lords as well, one of unwavering loyalty and complete duty to one's superiors. In other words, it was considered to just be just a one-way street. Like, you as a samurai. <laughs> I'm always going to say like that because I don't I hate it when people use the word in English. I really do. So like your duty as a warrior is to sort of like obey and do what your your lord tells you no matter what, like it's absolute obedience and that's it. Um, but the problem is that actually that's not really how the warriors of medieval Japan understood their relationship to their lords. They actually understood it far more as a contractual relationship. And so what I mean by that is that, like, on the one hand, the warrior understands, like, you know, I serve you as my lord, like, I offer you my, my capabilities as a warrior and as someone who can cut people's heads off. In exchange, you are expected to provide for me and reward me in some manner. And as our historical example above of Takuji shows, that, like, you know, it was perfectly normal for a 
a warrior, even like someone in sort of like in the lesser nobility to suddenly be like, you know, actually, I don't really feel like my Lord is treating me all that well. And so I'm just going to make a different arrangement. So literally when he felt like the, the whole Joe clan wasn't treating him the way he was supposed to be treated, he made alternative arrangements with the emperor and the emperor capitalized on that fact, not just with Takauji, but with a lot of other um, warrior clans as well. And that was seen as perfectly normal. Like no one thought of that as a great disgrace as like, you know, like all this crap that we get fed nowadays about sort of like Japanese notions of honor and duty. Like it is crap. It actually is just crap because the the people themselves who lived at this in this time period who were the ones doing the fighting, they didn't see it that way at all. They saw it, as I said, as being as a contractual relationship. Like I honor my end of the bargain. And if you don't honor your end of the bargain, then the, the contract is null and void and I can do whatever I want. And so what's interesting about this is that as a result, in later periods in Japanese history, Takauji is often understood as kind of a villain. And a lot of this also has to do with the fact that there's this famous writer, um, Chikafsa, who wrote a book called um, On Gods and Sovereigns. Now, Chikafsa was a loyalist <laughs> to Emperor Godaigo. So as you can imagine, he doesn't speak all that fondly of the guy who betrayed Godaigo. But um, contemporary accounts, like aside from Chikafsa's, don't actually really judge Takuji all that harshly at all. I mean, in fact, in many ways, they're just indifferent. They don't, they don't judge either way. It's just like he did this for the, these reasons, and that's it. So another important aspect of um, warrior culture in this period is... I didn't really know how else to define this. I'm going to refer to it as like a class consciousness, but this is not class consciousness. Well, I guess it is class consciousness in the Marxist sense. It's just that in Marx's terms, he would often talk about like the class consciousness of, you know, workers and, you know, the working class. Um, here, this is sort of the, the class consciousness of the nobility of the, the aristocracy. But what's interesting is that, um, so even though a lot of the warrior families were descended to some extent from the aristocracy and from the nobility, they didn't necessarily think of themselves as nobility. In fact, that guy that I mentioned earlier, Chikafsa, in his work, he makes this distinction between Kuge, the nobility, and the Bushi, the warriors, as being sort of distinct things. Um, but particularly in this, you know, from this period on, I mean, arguably from the Kamakura period on, but definitely from the Muramachi period on, the samurai sort of reinvent themselves as a new aristocracy. And they thought of themselves as basically superior to all other social classes. So, and by other social classes, I mean things like, you know, merchants, uh, peasants, which is to say farmers, um, artisans, and so forth. Um, their relationship to the nobility, as, as Chikafsa actually rightly notes in his work, is, is a complicated one. But they definitely thought them as themselves as the ones as like sort of the overlords of the, the people that they they were around on a day-to-day -day basis. The other thing that's interesting about samurai in this period is that they, they actually thought of themselves as kind of like a leisure class. Um, one of the one of the, the really cool things about the, the Murimachi period is that this is really sort of um, this is sort of an artistic height, despite the fact of like constant warfare, you see a lot of like literary and artistic development in this period. Whereas in say the Heian period, in a lot of cases, like at least artistically and architecturally, they're really just kind of mimicking Chinese things. It's like sort of, sort of like Japanese painting at that time was really very similar to Chinese painting at that time. And Japanese architecture at that time was very similar to Chinese architecture at that time. But now we're going to start to get something that is more distinctly Japanese. We're going to get you know distinctly Japanese architecture. We're going to get distinctly Japanese art forms. We're going to get distinctly Japanese aesthetic practices like flower arranging and tea ceremony and all that stuff that really originates in this period. And the, the samurai, samurai, the warriors, thought of themselves as the only class with enough like free time to cultivate these things and sort of by cultivating these art forms also cultivating themselves. And so I, I do want to look, so in one of the readings, um, sort of the shorter one, I want to look at something that Yamaga says. So this is um, Yamaga Soko. Oh, where is this? The tasks of a, so starting right here. Maybe I'll, I'll make this a little 
There we go. The tasks of a samurai are to reflect on his person, to find the Lord and do his best in service, to interact with his companions in a trustworthy and warm manner, and to be mindful of his position while making duty his focus. In addition, he will not be able to avoid involvement in parent, child, sibling, and spousal relations. Without these, there could be no proper human morality among all other people under heaven. And so there is this sense then that, where is it? Where does he say this? The task of farmers, artisans, and merchants. So that's the sort of the lower classes, or what um, Yamaga calls the common classes, as according to this translation. Do not allow free time, which means they are not always able to care for these relationships and fulfill the way. Here, the way actually refers to the Buddhist way. So this is the the um, the dole that you often. So it's, it is the dole in, in Bushido, but it's not the same thing. This is sort of like a spiritual path. A samurai, <laughs> a samurai, a samurai puts aside the tasks of the farmers, artisans, and merchants to make the way his exclusive duty. And so this is an important point here where like the, unlike all of these other people in Japanese society, the warrior is the one, like the warrior classes are the ones who have the time to cultivate this sort of spiritual identity, unlike, you know, working folk who have to labor their entire lives. Um, sort of the, the other thing that I want to take away from that selection from um, Yamaga Soko is actually this right here. Um, the warrior classes also saw themselves as having the duty to punish the immorality of the so-called common classes. So if we go back to <coughs> this selection, he says right here, in addition, if ever a person who is improper with regard to human morality appears among the three common classes, the samurai quickly punishes them, thus safeguarding true heavenly morality on earth. It should not happen that a samurai knows the virtues of letters and arms but fails to use them. Thus, formally, a samurai will prepare himself in the use of swords, etc., etc., while inwardly he will exert himself in the relationship of lord, vassal, friend, parent, child, etc., etc. In his mind, he pursues the civility of letters, while outwardly he is prepared martially. And so, but what's interesting, and especially since Yamaga is speaking from a much later period in Japanese history, like there is this sense that the the martial capability of the samurai, the ability to wield weapons and so forth, is something that puts him in a position to then like <laughs> punish slash like essentially exploit. I mean, I, let, let, let's be honest about this, it, exploit the lower classes. Like it is his quote unquote duty to make sure that all of these other classes stay in line. And Yamaga doesn't say this in his text, but this is also an allusion to the fact that oftentimes there were um, peasant uprisings, particularly in this period, in the Muramachi period, there were quite a few peasant uprisings, often led by warrior monks and sort of the, the powerful monasteries in the area surrounding Kyoto. Um, this doesn't really come up so much in the, the bit of the Taiheiki that I'm going to have you guys read. But the the sort of the three major like political centers of power, like, I mean, I'm going to talk a lot about two of them, which is sort of, you know, the, the imperial, I talked a lot about the imperial court and sort of the warrior classes. But the, the third major center of power in medieval Japan is really sort of the monasteries. And the, these aren't your, your daddy's monasteries. These aren't the monasteries of the Heian period. Well, actually, they are the monasteries of the Heian period as well. But they often um, bred a sort of like warrior culture amongst them, often because like people who were once warriors in their lives, like retired to become um, monks and Buddhist priests and but never really gave up their sort of martial tendencies. So let's see, let's stop the share for a moment. So that's where I'm going to leave off with this video. Um, that's just sort of a brief introduction to sort of the warrior culture and then um, in the next video, I'm going to be talking about the Taiheiki, and we'll get a lot more into the details and sort of like the application of like how this stuff works and how we see it in the like the, the, the you know, the finer points of the, the accounts and texts from this period. So I will see you all again in a little bit. So bye for now.